Dr. Drissa Kony, uh, who is not in your program, and not his bio, but I know him. From Cameroon. Yes, yeah, stand up, stand up. Come on up. Yeah, turn on the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn on the uh, internet. Cameroon. You, you, uh, Ivory Coast, close by, west coast of Africa. Ivory Coast. And uh, unificationist wife from Mongolia. Beautiful daughter. Yeah. And he's a pastor of our family federation community in Westchester County. West, we call West Rock, and professor at UTS. Uh, Dr. Coney is going to provide a commentary on the two presentations we've heard so far. Let's welcome Dr. Drissa Coney. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so um, I'm going to uh, respond by raising more questions. <laughs> so, um, and of course, I'm, I'm deeply humbled to... Um, you know, to respond to those eminent professors, uh, Dr. Charles and Dr. Frank uh, Kaufman, who was also my professors. And um, the first thing that I, um, you know, when I read their papers, um, I have seen um, Dr. Frank uh, presentation was highly intellectual and Dr. Charles was more practical. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with the, um, with Dr. Frank um, presentation. This is the, yeah, okay, let me see. And because I only have eight minutes, I'm gonna just jump to the uh, last, the, maybe the, um, the last part of my presentation, but um, because I wanna have enough time to talk about it. So Dr. Kaufman actually raised four, um, four points. And the first one was um, uh, Reverend Moon's teaching and how he embodies his, his own teaching. And it became a model for uh, most unificationists. But one question that we uh, raise today is, um, how can we, how can the followers embody his teaching? Because that's um, the, the biggest question. Uh, Reverend Moon himself lived a, an exemplary life and uh, he was able to live a deep spiritual life. And um, even in his, um, you know, how he dealt with his enemies. And uh, the challenge that, is, that we're facing, um, not just as, you know, unificationists, but for even those who are affiliated to the unification movement, how the life of the founder of the unification movement can become a model that, people practice? I think this is a question that we should all reflect on. As we are celebrating 100 years anniversary, maybe the uh, 100 years coming can be a theological uh, discussion on, on that practical aspect. The second one is the establishment of a faith community built on, his teach, on this teaching. So uh, as Dr. Kaufman said, since its inception, the Holy Spirit Association was ecumenical um, since the beginning. Um, and um, what we have seen is a struggle between a denominational organization or interdenominational organization. That tension is there. So even though the Holy Spirit Association has tried to you know, bring Christians together, but they also remain a denomination in many ways as a church. Um, and even after becoming the Family Federation for World Peace, which is uh, kind of going beyond the church aspect of things, there is still that tension about church or beyond church, which is interfaith or um, of, of family um, organization. The third point is investment in the theological and religious academy. So the focus, um, the, the discussion more and more is the, that theological school should focus more on raising unification leaders or actually uh, continuing the path of interfaith, um, interfaith oriented um, curriculum and training others. And finally, is investment in interfaith activism and improve relations uh, among religion and believers. Uh, the question that is coming here, what is the end in mind? So this is a question that we have to reflect on why all these religions, organizations are coming together, what's the end point? 
and um, and this discussion should be part of of um, the, the theological discussion. It should be part of the theological discussion. Now, I'm going to you know cite a different uh, source in turn, uh, no, in, and we can look at together, but more specifically in America, how the religious landscape has been changing uh, over time. So this is the, the Pew Research Center. Uh, by the time, um, you know, um, actually Reverend Moon was, you know, born and then started his, um, certainly his ministry, early ministry, um, there were 30% evangelical Protestant uh, in America. And about the time, um, you know, the Family Federation was launched in 1996, it dropped down to 19. And there were mainline Protestant were 22% and dropped to 11. Black, historical black Protestant was five and then uh, goes up to seven, seven, and then dropped to six, six. Uh, the Catholic was 24 and dropped to um, 16. Other Christian groups, such as um, you know Mormons or Orthodox Christian, three and then four. I'm um, sorry, yeah, three, three, and then you know sustain, you know stay to three. And we have other group um, like different other religions, um, and as you can see four, five, six, and then increasing. And you have the biggest group that unaffiliated has been started, you know, and in the 1920s to 45 was 11 and then increases to 36. So reality is when you look at this, uh, uh, you know, this source, all denominational religions have been decreasing as time goes by. And um, so, you know, what can we learn from that? You know, because more and more, um, you know, a lot of other, you know, even organizations, religious organizations are trying to, in, you know, to be op open-minded and try to include interfaith work because some of them realize that the, the century that we are going in is going to be interfaith or ecumenical. So, and which gave me, um, I'm not going to go through this, but it's going to give it gave me the chance to go into the second presentation, and I'm going to comment on only one um, one reflection. As Doctor, two minutes, okay. Doctor Doctor Charles raised three points: um, one on Christianity, the second of Islam brotherhood, and the third one was unity and unification. So I'm going to comment the power of brotherhood in Islam. You know, the Ummah Islamic um, is a powerful concept in Islam. And, um, but the challenge there is how to harmonize the religious identity and national identity. Um, what comes first for most Muslim is the Ummah, which is the worldwide Islamic community. The Islamic, bro the Islamic brother is beyond boundaries. Brotherhood is beyond boundaries. So when a Palestinian is killed or murdered, a Muslim from Sudan feel affected, even they're not from the same um, country. So, and um, in fact, when injustice happened to one Muslim, it's happening to all Muslims. That's the concept beyond brotherhood. And um, so the Muslim have the right to defend and fight back that we refer to as lesser jihad. And, um, and of course, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said a lesser jihad is going to end. But there is not a form of jihad called greater jihad, which is the internal struggle to overcome the evil within. So... The uh, Prophet Muhammad recommended that greater jihad be uh, what, you know, greater jihad will be uh, what will bring lasting peace and actually discourage lesser jihad, which is fighting someone who did you wrong. So I want to conclude my point here. 
and uh, and I hope we can have a better uh, discussion later. Thank you.